Friday was one of those days where the temperature changed a lot. Our family, that Friday afternoon, we thought, hey, today's the day we should go see the zoo lights. It's going to be great. It was a beautiful afternoon, so we bought our tickets and thinking to ourselves, well, we're going to get there before the weather gets too cold. Well, what was available was uh, a 7.30 entry time, and what happened between the 60 degrees on Friday afternoon became about mid-40 degrees with wind blowing pretty strongly there through the zoo, and I wasn't prepared for that. I had my short sleeve shirt on and I had a jacket, but a little bit lighter jacket than I might have chosen. Otherwise, I could have been better prepared. This season, we are all together preparing for the birth of Christ. And sometimes I feel ready for Christmas to be here and other times I feel like I am not ready at all. Today is the third Sunday of the season of Advent, and for many of our neighbors, it's an invitation to be prepared for this holiday, for the tinsel and the, the, the songs and the presents and the shopping and counting down the days towards this grand celebration. For followers of Jesus, it is perhaps a little bit different. It's not all about the holiday festivities. Instead, this season is about Christmas, the celebration of Jesus. We're looking forward to the day when God's kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven, where people will walk in light, find joy, and love will bind us all together. That is the home that we're longing for, that we're anticipating, that we're looking forward to, and that we're living into today. And our invitation this season is to come home to, for Christmas. Two weeks ago, we launched the season of Advent by naming that it's easy to get caught in the day-to-day -day anxieties of our lives. And the good news is that we can see glimpses of God's kingdom that appear even when we least expect it. Jesus invites us to pay attention, to pay attention to the light and the life that is all around us. Last week, we began the story of John the Baptist, realizing that God chose an unlikely person in John the Baptist to help prepare the way for Jesus. It is easy to feel unworthy or not good enough, and yet the good news is that God chooses unlikely people like you and me and John the Baptist to help prepare the way for Jesus. This week, we continue the story of John the Baptist as we look to find the joy of home. Now, on Friday also, I was surprised in the afternoon to realize that it was raining. The, the, the gray skies and the dripping clouds put a bit of a damper on the holiday preparations for me. Um, it was as if the poinsettias were duller somehow and uh, they were dampened by the clouds outside. It was as if the, the lights in the evening that, that light up the street usually, uh, they were still the same, but somehow they weren't quite as festive when, when the, uh, the clouds were just spitting from the sky. And yet Christmas is coming. And that's the power of Christmas. It comes whether we are ready or not. It's the incarnation. It is God with us. There is an always and yet when it comes to Christmas. We may feel dreary and yet there is joy. Underneath and behind all of it, there is joy, persistent and transforming and sustaining joy. And Christmas isn't really about a seasonal pleasure. It isn't really about the ex extravagant commercial excesses either. It's a reminder of the joy that is always ours if we receive it, if we allow ourselves to be open to God's love at work in our lives. It's an encouragement to our flagging spirits and a kick in the pants to our bland apathy to the world at large at times. It, at least it would have been a kick in the pants if John the Baptist had his way. Now, John the Baptist was kicking pants and cracking heads from the very beginning. He kicked inside his mother, Elizabeth, before he was born, when he heard Mary tell the news of the coming uh, Christ child. And I have to imagine that he was born kicking too. He kicked himself out of the house as soon as possible. He went out to the wilderness, was kicking down beehives to get some food, shaking trees to get the locusts out of it, and, and putting on dead, dead camel's fur, inside out no less, to be more uncomfortable to make his way around the desert, was shouting at rocks, I imagine, and stones. And, and then he started the shouting at people, gathering them at the riverside and deciding it's time to get some sense kicked into the people of God. Now, <laughs> I kind of get a kick out of what seems like a throwaway line here in verse 18. With many other words, John appealed to them, proclaiming good news to the people. Well, what were those other words? It seems like we have plenty of text that he recorded himself. What else did he poke? And and the good news, I don't know that that words from John the Baptist in the reading a few moments ago sounded like very much good news. Oppressive, maybe, 
finger pointing and name calling, perhaps, how in the world can we say he proclaimed the good news and yet he did proclaim the good news? Now, it's not unusual in our family for someone to come to another person and say, well, you want to hear the good news or the bad news? Which do you want to hear first? And as a parent, sometimes I use this strategy to help ease the discomfort of bad news at times or temper the good news uh, with a bit of reality. And sometimes when I hear that choice offered to me by someone else, I get a little pit in my stomach wondering what exactly is the bad news. Whatever the good news is fine and the bad news, well, I'm not sure I want to hear about it. And that's the problem with good news sometimes. Sometimes there has to be bad news first for the good news to be good news and john understood that he was a pro at sharing lousy information with people so that the good news could be good he let the people have it there were crowds of people that were coming to him to the river to be baptized well how does he respond does he welcome them in does he shake their hand does he make sure they sign in at the welcome table no 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 he doesn't do any of that he says you children of snakes who warned you to escape from the angry judgment that's coming? The ax is already at the root of the trees, implying that, he is ready, that God is ready to cut down the people of Israel. And I hear those words and I think, hey, John, take it easy. Calm down a little bit. Is, is, and yet, is that what the crowds think? Well, it seems not to be what they think. They asked him instead with fear and trembling, what then should we do? If this is the case, what should we do? And he answered in a way that made sense to them because more people came and they kept coming. What should we do? What about us? I can imagine it echoing along the riverbank. Tax collectors and soldiers asked him. Imagine today athletes and administrators, politicians and police officers, tycoons and truck drivers, restaurant workers and refugees. We all come in one and dozens or pairs and ask, what should we do? And John has an answer for us. He says to produce fruit that shows you have changed your heart and lives. In other words, live in a way that demonstrates how God is at work among us, how God is at work in your life. He told the soldiers to live for justice. Don't abuse your power, he says. Don't threaten to get your way. Don't scare or coerce the population. Instead, learn contentment. Don't keep wanting more and more and more. He told the tax collectors to live for mercy. Don't take more than the people can stand, he says. Don't take more than you should take. Don't rob or steal. Care about the people over whom you have authority. John the Baptist proclaims to the crowd on the banks of the river years and years ago and proclaims to us today, produce fruit that shows that you have changed your heart and life. Live in generosity, live in community, live as though you belong to one another because we do belong to one another. Live as though we are responsible for each other because we are. Jesus' great invitation is to, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to love not only those that we like or want to spend time with, but to love those that we would even call our enemies. We are bound together by God's creation, by God breathing life into each one of us. God's love is for each person, not just those that we might prefer. You see, the good news is that we are all made right by the birth and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We may feel that sometimes we've made a mess of things, and yet God's offer of love and forgiveness is still with us. So live faithfully. Produce fruit, not to earn God's love, but because of God's love. Do justice and practice mercy and walk humbly with our God, not, because, not to make ourselves right with God, but because we have been made right with God, because we have repented, because we've turned around and are facing a new direction, because we've turned from our own way and instead are turning towards the home that God invites us to, home in heaven and home here on earth where God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven, where the righteous are, are offer themselves in service to others and those that are lowly are lifted up. Our invitation is to walk with Jesus 
and to produce the fruit of love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. And Christmas is a glimpse of that place, a glimpse of that home where all of those things are true for each one. So come, let us adore him. Even if we don't feel prepared, know that God is on the way and that even on a gray, rainy, cold day, God can fill us with the fullness of Christmas and the joy of home. Will you pray with me? Oh God, we ask that you would help us be ready for you. And even if we're not, that you come into our lives anyway. For your love that knows no bounds, for your mercy that's extended to each one of us, we give you thanks. Strengthen and guide us by the power of your Holy Spirit and help us to find the joy of home with you. We offer ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.